Welcome everyone to our Spotlight on Practice series. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with two exceptional educators, Jackie Moses and Sean Maselli from Geelong Grammar School. Uh, they've been at the forefront of developing and implementing student well-being initiatives that I'm sure will inspire our audience of educators. Before we dive into our conversation with them, I'd love to give you a little background. Um, in 2022, Jackie launched Project Hope at our Turek campus uh, with a mission to equip students with the skills and strategies to embrace a positive outlook and realize their potential. And building on the success, uh, the 2023 initiative expanded to include our Bostock House campus with a strong emphasis on fostering a sense of belonging within our GGS primary community. Uh, working closely with GGS primary staff, Jackie, Sean, and myself uh, developed a dynamic scope and sequence document that encompasses key sub-themes like physical and emotional safety, social connection, and inclusive environment. And this document serves as a bit of a roadmap for intentional classroom activities and whole school practices, supporting a deep sense of belonging and creating a collaborative community of practice among our GGS staff. So today we're going to explore uh, the valuable insights, strategies, and successes that Jackie and Sean have gained through their work on Project Hope and building uh, the belonging scope and sequence, and our goals to provide some practical wisdom and inspiration to educators looking to prioritize student well-being in their own contexts. So let's dive into the conversation and discover some of the remarkable work that Jackie and Sean have been doing to place well-being at the heart of education. So thanks guys for joining me. So lovely to have you. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for having us, Jen. No worries. Um, so if I could just start out by getting you to share a little bit about your background and how it's influenced your work in student well-being. Sure. So sure. I'll go here, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I've been teaching at Geelong Grammar School for 11 years and um, was initially drawn to the school, I guess, because of the priority that it places on student wellbeing through a holistic approach to education, as well as the professional learning and development that we're privy to, mm. particularly in the area of posed, restorative practice and inclusivity. Uh, I also found that the principles of positive psychology and the teaching and learning just aligned with positive education and it just made so much sense to me and I think it's important that our students learn the principles of forgiveness and kindness and curiosity and compassion um, so that they're able to talk about their well-being and yeah as this I guess supports the emotional and well-being literacy um, mm. of, of them and others so yeah I feel quite passionate about um, that element of it as well. That's lovely, Jackie. Thank you. And how about you, Sean? Yeah, so for me at both schools that I've been lucky enough to work at, um, both obviously GGS and the school I was at previously, um, student well-being and well-being initiatives were both strongly prioritized. Um, I've been able to work along some amazing educators who have a passion for well-being like myself. Mm -hmm. um, and similar to what Jackie's mentioned, that emphasis on the, the development of the whole child mm -hmm. is something that has been consistent from when I started as a grad to where mm -hmm. I'm at now, which has been, um, which strongly connects with who I am as an educator and a person. Yeah. But when kind of reflecting back um, to my foot in the door moment when it came, comes to well-being and pause ed, um, came at my previous school where I was lucky enough to be involved in what we call the Grow Your Mind Day. Um, which focused on Carol Dweck's work around growth mindsets. Mm. Um, and through the involvement in that, I really found myself connecting with well-being and and um, th that particular initiative. Mm. Um, so following that, I joined a, a positive working party that was created at the school and we were involved in um, carrying out different um, student well-being initiatives. Um, but one of the bigger initiatives I was part of was um, a visible well-being facilitator. Um, and I did that work through Lee Waters' um, mm. curriculum of visual well-being, and that really opened my door to a, a lot of the research that is behind well-being. Um, mm. And it also enabled me to be a part of taking the staff through that visual well-being journey. Um, so for me, that really connected with me as an educator in terms of well-being and, and brought to my attention the importance of really making well-being visible for children. And that's mm. something that I, I I strive for every day now um, in my role here at GGS. Mm. Um, 
so yeah, I think my experience is specifically around that work as a facilitator as part of that visible well-being curriculum really supported my uh, what I, where I'm at now. Lovely. Yeah, that resonates both of you know what both mm. of you have said is really resonates with me about the yeah, that importance of of educating the whole child. Mm. Um, and I loved what you guys uh, said about, you know, the importance of having this work be uh, underpinned by evidence and, um, you know, the knowledge base that we have out there around student well-being. Um, so I guess that leads nicely to my question for you, Jackie, about you know, what inspired and informed uh, the creation of Project Hope for you? Mm. Um, well, I guess essentially after two years of COVID impacted classrooms, uh, our head of campus, Nicole Ganane and myself were speaking just about the use of wellbeing data and how we can use that to inform positive education at the campus. Mm. And, you know, I guess as educators, we all know that those years were particularly challenging for our young people as the world that they kind of knew it had been turned upside down and their formative years were being really disrupted. Um, so we started thinking about what we saw that was evident through conversations and interactions in the yard and you know, comments such as, you know, I don't really feel as though there's anything to look forward to at the moment, or I've stopped planning activities because they kept getting cancelled, mm. just kept coming up, although that kind of, that those that tone of conversation kept coming up. So we just thought that it was quite evident that their levels of optimism about the future was being really profoundly affected. Mm. Um, and interestingly, I guess, but not surprisingly, these comments aligned with the findings gathered from our school-wide wellbeing survey that we carry out annually. And although the students were generally buoyant, the perception that they had on their ability to plan and accomplish things uh, was lower in previous years. So we kind of married the two. We married what was going on on a global level and 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 then what was going on in a micro level, which in mm. Melbourne and then particularly at our school and yeah. um, taking into account their conversations, our observations, and then the data that had been collated. Um, and in that time, I was also studying my map and um, needed, you know, I was, I've always been very interested in hope, but also wanted to, thought it was a great opportunity to marry the two. So I guess essentially we responded to the situation in a way that we thought was really relevant. Yes. And our Project Hope was born. It was, it's, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's been a lovely initiative, Jackie. I haven't had the chance yeah. to talk through the most recent findings with you, but um, you'll be pleased to know that hope levels um, are much higher now uh, yeah. in this most recent um, round of well-being data and are above the Australian norms now. So it just shows how worthwhile initiatives like Project Hope are. And, yeah, um, most definitely. And digging into belonging as well. And uh, Sean, just... Curious, um, you know, I guess ja Jackie touched on this with um, the challenges, the unique challenges we've seen for young people um, through the pandemic and returning to face to face learning, you know, things like anxiety and hopelessness and, and all of those uh, kinds of things that educators around the world are noticing. Um, how did you um, adapt your approach to supporting student well-being during this time, if at all? Yeah, so one thing, like Jackie mentioned, one thing coming out of COVID that was the biggest challenge that I've observed myself, but that a lot of educators have shared with me as well, um, is the development of social skills. So when you're, when you're being reflective on children that maybe were in ELC or in prep when we were entering that COVID world, they would have two years of really um, crucial times where they would be building those social skills, um, entering into their primary school um, life essentially. Mm. So being in and out of the physical and digital learning spaces has just meant that children haven't had that opportunity to practice their social skills. Mm. Um, so when reflecting on how I have personally targeted and explicitly taught some of these social skills, a major way has been through um, units of inquiry. Um, so being a PYPIB school, um, specifically our Who We Are unit of inquiry. So ours this year focuses on how emotions can have a positive impact on our relationships. So this is such a critical understanding for children at this stage in time. Uh, I guess it should be noted that I teach year one. Um, so we made the decision to run this unit of inquiry all year long. Mm -hmm. Usually units of inquiry run for a fixed number of weeks, but we decided because 
um, social skills and emotional regulation um, are points of need at this point in time. We figured that this would be a, a wonderful time to have this unit stretch all year long and dip in and out throughout the year. Um, and we've noticed it's been really positive hearing the children's development of their emotional literacy and their ability to talk through problems that they're having within their relationships. So I think for us explicitly teaching emotional regulation and as well these social skills through units of inquiry has been really beneficial. Fantastic, lovely. Thanks so much. Yeah, that, what an important work um, to be able to adapt and shift to meet the needs of, of young people and the challenges that they're facing. So that's a really great example of how you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess linking that back to Project Hope more broadly, Jackie, um, mm -hmm. just curious um, if you might be able to give maybe one or two examples of what um, what occurred in Project Hope uh, in 2022 that you thought were really beneficial uh, initiatives that came out of that? Yeah, I think, um, look, ultimately, I think when there's a shared vision, um, there becomes this shared vocabulary amongst the community and I, the related concepts that we focused on um, that were connected to hope and improving levels of hope, essentially, um, were, yeah, that became, that was at the forefront. So that shared vision, it meant that there was an aligned focus, which meant that the dialogue between staff was similar, but also the language between the students was similar. Um, and it also meant that we could celebrate what was going on at, at public, for, um, public forums like assemblies or, you know, a theme for church may have been aligned to hope and, mm. um, yeah, just but really unpacking what it is, what elements you need in order to increase hope or build mm -hmm. hope. Um, yeah, yeah think, and yeah, that I think that's so so important, isn't it? That that it sounds mm -hmm. like that focal point. Um, mm. You know, rather than just well-being globally or generally, mm. to have that real focus meant that, uh, you know, yeah, you could unpack the definition of that that one concept and hang things off of it. It gave it a bit yeah. of a, a nice structure to work with and yeah. I think, um, students and staff could buy into that. Mm. I think one thing as well, Jackie, I know that we're reflecting on Project Hope, but when we're mm. thinking about that question in the lens of belonging as well, mm. our theme of this mm. year, I think that common language is so important. And now, Jackie, mm -hmm. for you in 2023, knowing the school has been through that whole project last year, you're still mm -hmm. able to bring that into what you're doing this year as well. So you're absolutely right with having that shared ownership over a theme all year long. It doesn't you don't lose the theme when you go into a new year. You still no, yeah. know where we've come from and you know that the students have been exposed to it. So it's something that you can just continue that conversation um, for years to come. Yeah, most definitely. Mm. That's awesome. And I think that links nicely then to the next question about, you know, how did you engage and involve different stakeholders in, um, you know, Project Hope in this uh, in this year's theme of belonging? Um, it sounds like part of it is that shared language uh, is help helps with kind of uh, with the buy in aspect um, and mm. fostering a bit of collaboration. But do you have any other um, tips or strategies that you use to really uh, get people on board and engaged? I think one thing when we're reflecting on the stakeholder of staff members, mm -hmm. um, the well-being initiatives that we have introduced and explored have been built by staff for staff. So I think that's something that automatically when you're involved in the planning and it's a collective approach, you naturally have more of a buy-in. It hasn't been the well-being team dictating all the decisions mm -hmm. um, through our co cross-campus collaboration. Um, They've built the initiatives such as our essential agreement across GGS primary, as well as the belonging scope and sequence. Mm -hmm. So ensuring they have a voice and are able to actually collaborate on these decisions that are being made in the direction that we're heading as GGS primary, um, it definitely has facilitated more of a buy-in. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I agree. And I also liked that we were, um, you know, we saw it as kind of working progress as well and, that, mm -hmm. and a working document, that scope and sequence. And invited staff continually, I guess, but mm. most most recently at our cross campus staff day, mm. just to join that working party. So we have we've had people come in and come out, you know, where where their own work and time enables them. But I think that's that's really helpful as well. So there's a great cross section of skill across the campuses. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think yeah. um, sticking with staff members, I think mm. the way that the information has been presented to them, it's been very digestible and practical. Mm. So I think naturally that supports teacher buy-in as well. Um, so when we're thinking about our year-long theme of belonging this year, we we're mindful of mapping one sub-theme per term rather than just saying our theme's belonging, go for it. Um, we've broken it down to very digestible parts and we've yes. given adequate time to be able to actually inquire into these sub themes. Um, one thing as well that Jackie and I have spoken about in terms of the way that we've delivered professional development, we want to do it in a way that we would do it with children. So staff mm-hmm. feel that comfortability thinking about how the staff session went and they might actually think, oh, I can do this the same way with my with my students. So then being able to make those connections and replicate similar practices, I think, has also supported that teacher buy in and and makes it seem more manageable for them. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I guess as a a real practical example, you know, both campuses use the PYP um, Mm. uh, curriculum. Mm. And so we, you know, with safety, for instance, psychological and emotional safety, we together came up with a series of questions that touched in uh, touched on those key uh, is a key methods so um, you know looking at uh, you'll have those to help concepts. me with yeah, the other key concepts, key concepts. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you key concepts yeah. and so yeah those, those kinds of questions inquiry based questions to explore yeah. that theme in a very in a very drilled down manner and actually getting the teachers to reflect on those questions and then they're the same questions that they can take into the classroom and mm-hmm. ask their students I think was really you know nice to kind of role model that and um, get the chance to wear that hat a bit and think okay what does it what does safety feel like what you know what are the elements that are in my surroundings that help me feel um, seen or accepted so yeah I think that that was really beneficial for sure. Same. I I liked that and I liked um, the fact that the questions, although, you know, we take, as being a PYP school, we teach through the lens of question posing often, Mm. but the questions were relatable to any age or stage across the campuses as well. So the same questions didn't need to be adjusted or modified or amended for different age groups. They, the, the same questions were posed and answers were answered depending on developmental stage, which has been really interesting to. Yeah. And I think as well, Mm -hmm. to piggyback Jackie, Mm because that's kind of from a a student lens, but also from a teacher lens, Mm -hmm. considering specialist teachers, as the questions are so open-ended, they can really be applied to any context or any discipline. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been a really valuable way to get not just classroom teacher buy-in, but all teacher buy-in, because the questions Mm -hmm. are quite open-ended. Yes, agreed. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that le- links nicely to this next uh, bit about, you know, how how did this belonging scope and sequence come about and what benefits did having this clear theme of belonging bring to to our well-being initiatives? Um, so, you know, I guess I can kick it off by explaining uh, a bit about the, the belonging scope and sequence, you know, like any other scope and sequence document, uh, breaking it down into the early years, uh, kind of middling primary and then later primary. And um, as you guys uh, mentioned and mentioned in the intro, um, took the idea, the concept of belonging and um, from a cross-campus um, planning meeting uh, last year uh, where staff kind of broke down what belonging means to them and looks like to them. Um, you know, we uh, considered which um, which themes and concepts kind of linked together and we came up with the three concepts of the emotional and psychological safety, uh, social connect- connection and inclusive environment. And so each of those kind of key themes um, are addressed in term two, term three, term four, and mm-hmm. um, and then kind of mapped the um, mapped the initiatives, ideas to, to those uh, three areas. I went away and and did a little bit of research on the evidence base behind each of those three different concept areas and, you know, just considered, okay, what, you know, what is important in uh, fostering a sense of safety? You know, what are some, uh, I guess, um, uh, I guess, recommendations that we can make for, you know, things like um, uniforms and having clear mm. rules and guidelines in the classroom and um, talking about, uh, 
you know, emotional literacy, you know, those kinds of things um, were built into the scope and sequence. Um, I think just when reflecting on the really early stages of it, mm -hmm. um, it like you mentioned, Jen, it came through our initial cross campus staff PL on belonging mm -hmm. and we we got those related concepts or those belonging keywords from actually us trying to establish an essential agreement. So mm -hmm. we wanted to establish an essential agreement across GGS primary and mm -hmm. part of that we wanted to make sure it was reflective of our year long theme of belonging. So once we had staff, um, I guess, submitting keywords of uh, words that come to mind when they think of belonging, we actually looked at all those all those words and we noticed some really beautiful commonalities. Mm. Um, so we then use that to not only write our essential agreement, but then also use those like you've said and map them across the four terms. Um, and the way in which we created those essential agreement statements was again through the key concepts um, of form and function. So staff actually got mm. to work together and they're each given one of those eight commonalities that we came up with. Mm. I believe seven commonalities that we came up with um, and they thought of uh, what is that concept like, a uh, related concept like, and how does it work? Um, so when you're thinking about maybe an example of safety, the question read, what is safety in our community and how does safety work in our community? They then collaborated to create statements that responded to each of those related concepts. Um, so it was quite a collaborative way to build that essential agreement. Yeah. But then we then use, like I said, those commonalities to then map them to each term and create those sub term, uh, sorry, those yeah. sub themes. Yeah. Um, so it was a very collective approach from staff. Um, and I think that's one of the most wonderful things about the scope and sequence is that it was built by staff. Yes, yeah. yes, I definitely. Mm. Yeah. Lovely. Um, and, and I think uh, one of the other real benefits of the initiatives to, you know, we've kind of touched on this already, um, but, you know, bringing in and helping gain buy in from other um, other mm -hmm. staff members as well who, you know, aren't just in the classroom, but for instance, you know, library staff, um, mm -hmm. they had a have have kind of um, taken it upon themselves to to you know provide links to books and um, maybe Jackie can you remind me what the the name is for yeah. the library um, we've got the, the, lib, the lib guide there it's like the hub mm. for our library but um I've also noticed in 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 that project alone mm. they've been more collaborative which has actually strengthened their connection and cross-campus mm. collegiality even just by virtue of doing that for us but I've I didn't, I'm sure, Sean, you're experiencing the same, but the library team here have been really receptive and helpful mm -hmm. to creating a space for staff to access resources. And it, you know, it can be um, a little bit daunting, I guess, for mm -hmm. some staff that may not feel well equipped or that don't have the toolkit to mm -hmm. um, teach, you know, a positive lesson should they need to. So I feel that yeah, the fact that they can just dive on in there, look at the related concept that's relevant to what they need and look at YouTube clip or a book mm. or, yeah, a peak resource. Yeah, that's lovely to hear you say that even, yeah. Yeah, that even library staff cross campus are feeling more connected. Mm. I, feel I, that think, too. I think before these initiatives, I would say the different campuses felt very siloed. I don't think they had mm. much to do with each other. And so that we have this kind of these overarching themes and this student well-being data that can really help unite um, the different campuses is really, um, I'd say, uh, just something worth celebrating for sure. Yeah, I agree. And I think as well, like we mentioned, the conceptual lens of the, the questions that are mapped to each of those sub themes allows for any staff member to hop in, use one of those questions with the children. Mm -hmm. So it's not that mm -hmm. it's catered only towards classroom teachers. It's really quite open and, and conceptual that any staff member can, can tap into any of those sub themes. Yeah, and and Sean, have you heard much from um, staff members about any feedback or responses um, on this theme, this focus? Yeah, I think one thing that I've noticed is that staff have come to me and said is they just love the united approach that we're taking to belonging. Um, and the fact that a lot of attention is being put towards it this year. Um, 
It allows us as staff members and the community, so looking outside to parents as well, to be aware of what we're focusing on and have those conversations related to it. Mm. Um, I've heard from staff members where they've shared that they've overheard student, students using some of that belonging language, um, like feeling mm. like they belong or feeling like they're being, uh, there's othering happening. Um, mm. So it's been great to actually get that feedback from teachers that are saying, oh, I've overheard children applying that belonging literacy um, when interacting with others independently. Um, and I think like Jackie mentioned earlier as well, having the United approach allows for any teacher to have any conversation with any student connecting to belonging because they know that it's something that we're focusing on. And now in terms to focusing on that physical and emotional safety, um, it's something that's being discussed at lineups, assemblies, when having restorative right. conversations with children. So I think just overall, the feedback that I've been received, that I have received is that we have this united approach and we're all on the same page with what our pause ed focus is. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, actually on that note, um, I have a couple of teachers in the Discovering Pause Ed course uh, from the Turac campus. And mm -hmm. while we were actually on the call for the, uh, the course, uh, one of the teachers unmuted herself and said, oh, I actually just got a little um, Nick the Stick drawing from one of my students. And it was, you know, a group of five little Nick the Stick characters all kind of huddled together. And it had, and he wrote belonging on to, uh, the top. Aww. And he just dropped it off and said, oh, I just wanted to give this to you. And she was just That's like so totally beautiful. smitten. And uh, so, yeah, really lovely to just get to witness some of those uh, beautiful, the trickling down effect of um, yeah. talking about belonging. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely lovely. Mm. Uh, so looking ahead, what are your future plans or goals for enhancing student well-being through uh, through these initiatives, through belonging or, um, you know, anything else that you're, I guess, um, starting to get a sense of where this could move next? Um, yeah, I would love to hear what you guys have in store for GDS mm -hmm. from here. Yeah, so. Belonging will absolutely continue to guide our approach for the remainder of the year. Um, so we will enhance student well-being through continuing to explore the scope and sequence. Um, so in term three, we'll be moving on from physical and emotional safety mm -hmm. and looking at communication and social connection. Mm -hmm. um, so this theme will allow us to focus on things like communication, um, engagement, respect and building those relationship skills that we've previously discussed that are so critical at this stage. Um, some of the questions that students might explore are what does it mean to communicate well and connect with others um, or even who do you have strong connections with and how do these uh, relationships make you feel. So um, I think continuing to lean on that scope and sequence will be something that will definitely guide our future plans. Yeah, Lovely. I agree. And then um, from there, term four, we will speak to the acceptance related concept by focusing on an inclusive environment. And um, this will include creating a book, teaching and learning about creating an environment where students feel welcome, accepted and valued, which I think I know in the planning stages of the scope and sequence, we thought that would tie in beautifully. It's almost coming mm. back to the, where it all started of yeah. what it means to belong in a space and how then can we ensure that this is maintained, I guess, in a sustainable mm -hmm. way? So um, we were thinking also of perhaps hosting some school wide um, initiatives alongside belonging or to complement. So we were thinking perhaps of a cultural fair or promoting gender equality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just spotlighting those elements and also a beautiful way just to bring people together in a way of inclusivity, I guess. But mm -hmm. it also coincides, I think we've got um, David Vinegar doing some work with us all as staff. So and he'll be doing some work on restorative practice. So that ties in beautifully with what he's yeah. doing as well. So yeah, that will be some additional theory, I guess, to support yeah. what we've already put together. And then I guess yeah, we'll start looking ahead. You know, we, we started thinking about belonging midway through term four last year, mm. um, which was great because it gave us some time to plan and get ahead around so that we could launch on staff day so that we mm. started the year. Um, I think the same will probably happen for next year. So, yeah. Lovely. 
And do you guys have any advice for educators who are interested in implementing similar approaches in their own context or, you know, any lessons that you learned that you'd like to share um, that, you know, the share with schools who are considering this really clear and strong theme in their well-being initiatives? I think for me, I would advise trying to make staff involved as much as possible in any initiatives that you're planning. Um, this will allow for quite a different um, array of perspectives and thinking to be involved, mm -hmm. but it also like we've already kind of highlighted throughout this discussion that staff will have a higher sense of ownership over the initiative and it'll make it more meaningful, uh, which will just result in higher engagement from staff, in my opinion. Um, it also allows for awareness of the initiative to be significant. So if everyone's involved, everyone knows that it's happening, which will also boost overall engagement. Um, also having sub themes, I think was really, has been really beneficial for us. So rather than just saying our theme is this, belonging, mm -hmm. um, actually breaking it down into solid, uh, smaller sub, sub themes allows it just to be a much more manageable, I think, for teachers or any staff members. And um, the more manageable it seems, the more buy-in that you will get. Um, and it really allows for such a targeted approach from the school community to work through their understandings of whatever the sub theme might be. Awesome. Yeah, Lovely. I agree. I um I had I had notes too of just yeah gather those interested staff together and mm -hmm. and collaborate really early on. I, I feel the more that people are invested, um, the greater chance any wellbeing initiative or any initiative um will be sustainable and meaningful for everyone. But mm -hmm. but it takes persistence as well. And I think mm -hmm. um you know it can often be something that is forgotten about in a very mm. content rich curriculum but mm. yeah the the meaningful element of it and the importance of it is mm. is key but it does take persistence and the, they're those well-being champions i guess aren't they on throughout the school that you kind of rely on and that need to maintain momentum for that ripple effect to occur yeah but um but i'd say data as well i think we've done mm. that quite well of just making sure that what we're doing is actually informed by data across many different ways. But um, yeah, and that can be just through conversations with staff about what's going on in the in the yard at recess and lunch to, you know, what people are bringing home or what people are bringing to school from their home life on Monday. I think all of those important yeah. elements contribute to the direction of wellbeing initiatives. Yes, completely. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm. I think that data informed approach is so helpful. Um, mm. And as you said, you know, whether that's through a student well-being survey or, you know, even just gathering qualitative data through a Microsoft's form, just mm. asking staff to just reflect on the, the you know, the climate and the culture of their their classrooms can be really helpful to help guide, yeah, guide uh, those initiatives um, and, and make sure that we're addressing the needs that students have. Lovely. And, you know, do you guys have any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to leave with the audience? Um, I think one thing that has really stuck with me in my well-being journey is to be really intentional about the well-being initiatives or exercises or themes that you're exploring with your students. Mm -hmm. So really circling back to that why um, I think is critical mm -hmm. for students actually to understand why they're doing certain um, things in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Um, so for example, when reflecting on well-being exercises, share to them why you're engaging in mindful breathing or brain breaks or strength spotting, whatever it can be. Mm -hmm. um, so it really allows them to connect those initiatives and the exercises to their overall feeling of well-being. Um, and I, I kind of touched on this earlier. One thing that I'm an advocate for is to try to intertwine and weave well-being through what you do every day. So thinking about how you can weave well-being into a math session or a writing session so it doesn't feel like this other thing that needs to be done. Um, I think it really should be weaved into everything that, that we're doing and mm -hmm. it shouldn't just be a, a standalone program, so to speak. So um, that's definitely one thing for me is to think about how you can actually circle back to the why and definitely mm -hmm. trying to weave it into your everyday. Lovely. Yeah, yeah to keep it as I'm a you. clear priority. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly support what you just said then as well. I, I think um, to, yeah, weaving it in, and I guess that's that kind of um, 
learning element for us as well that it's really mm. important that we as professionals and, and educators but also people that are passionate about well-being and quite invested in learning about the theory and the practice of well-being and knowing the why once we know it and live it we can then teach it and it becomes embedded and i feel mm. that that kind of cycle is is really important as is the fact that i love that we're not restricted to a program as such like mm -hmm. um we're, we're really blessed in that way as professionals we've been given a great deal of agency to create something that's you know based on theory and literature and mm. great rigor but we've it's still creative for us to even yeah. put together I, I, I think that's great i think a framework is really beneficial rather than a program as such mm. yes. Um, yes and i just think any step taken to prioritize and value the well-being of our students is really important so yeah it's any any small implementation that we that you can start um and take a little risk i guess it's sometimes it's not that easy you know we can step out of our comfort zone ourselves and yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie and Sean, for sharing your inspiring uh, journey with us today. It's just been really lovely to hear you guys talk about something that you're so clearly passionate about and uh, dedicated to and, and getting to hear uh, your creative and innovative approach uh, is truly commendable. So, you know, we're confident that your in, uh, the insights that you brought to the table will motivate and guide educators within our community of practice and beyond. So thanks so much for joining me today, guys. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for the thanks, opportunity to Jen. chat. Thanks Fantastic. For us. Thank yeah. you. And and thanks to all of you who've joined in uh, to listen to our interview. And uh, we encourage you to stay tuned for some more inspiring stories in our Spotlight on Practice series. Until next time, be well.